Let's get settled in. Okay, so for today, uh, our goal is going to be continuing on our discussions from last week. And we were talking about Brownian motions and looking at certain properties of Brownian motion. Okay, can we settle down, please? Great, thank you. So, as I mentioned, we're going to continue on with our discussions of Brownian motions from last week. I'm going to review some of the main points that we talked about. And then we'll go on to uh, some connections with finance a little bit. And then I'm going to come back to this idea of how to define a stochastic integral. And at the end of last class, we talked about um, uh, a particular stochastic integral, and we looked at an experiment, a computer experiment, to show that that stochastic integral isn't what you would expect it to be from standard calculus. So by the end of today, hopefully we'll be able to talk about this concept, which comes from uh, a, a little lemma, which is probably shouldn't be called a lemma, but that's the name that's been used called Ito's Lemma, and um, we'll see where that comes from by the end of the class. Okay, so quick review. Brownian motion. So what is the Brownian motion? Let's recall, I'm going to actually start using the symbol W for the Brownian motion because it's, it's, it's that's a little more standard than X. We started using X simply because historically we've always use little x as the Bernoulli random variables that built the tree, and when we took the limit, then we saw some properties of that, of that, um, of that process, and so we kept x as a symbol for the continuous time limit. But now we're starting directly in continuous time, so I can throw away that notation and, and start afresh. Uh, so Brownian motions are also known as Wiener processes, and that's where the notation WT is often used. Sometimes you'll see it written as B sub T, by the way, anyone happen to know uh, where Brownian motion was first observed in terms of an observation described? Was it in the physics context, the finance context? I don't know, biology context? Yeah? Particle physics. It's actually well before particle physics, in fact. Yeah. It's actually a botanist. Somebody who was studying plants who noticed Brownian motion. What they were doing, they were looking at pollen suspended in water and they noticed that the pollen was moving around erratically even though the, mo the liquid was not moving at all. And so although they, uh, Brown is the name of the, of the individual who noticed this, that's why it's called Brownian motion, and uh, he did not have an explanation for it, and Einstein later came up with an explanation for it as bombardment of particles and also from light uh, inundating on the, uh, in the, hitting the pollen, knocking it around. So that's a, a little bit of historical reference there. And Wiener is the mathematician, um, who's also a physicist as well, who formalized the theory. So um, Brownian motions we're going to denote by, uh, as a stochastic process um, by W sub T. And uh, there are a few main properties, as we discussed last time. So they start from zero. Of course, you can always start it from a point that isn't zero, but that's the standardized version of the Brownian motion. Starts from zero. It has a distribution at every point in time, t, to be normal with mean zero and variance t. The increments are stationary and independent. Okay, now remember intuitively what the stationarity means is if you look at the increment of the process at some point in the future, you can slide that window back to time zero and it has the same property. Okay, so the distributional properties depend only on the size of the window. That's what the stationarity part means. So I'll put a little bit, uh, a little more detail here. So for example, WT plus S minus WT equals in distribution Ws. Okay? So it only depends on the size of the window and not on the location of where you start, the, start observing the process. And the independence property, so this is our stationary property,
And the independence property says that if you look at the increment of the Brownian motion over two distinct set of times, so distinct meaning that the interval, um, so I'll say this is independent of that whenever, so T1, so the T's are all ordered, but in particular, you have this kind of inequality. So T3, the interval T3 to T4 does not overlap with the interval T1 to T2. Okay, so if there's no overlap, then you have this independence between the increments of the, of the Brownian motion over those two intervals. Okay, that's, this is one, of, um, one very important property. And then there was a final one. Does anyone remember what that final property happened to be? Continuous paths. Paths are continuous. Or, continue, or the process has continuous paths, however you'd like to state, state it. Okay, so these are, the, these are the, the sort of workhorses of Brownian motion. If you have these pieces of, of evidence then, or this, this piece of knowledge about the, the process, you can do pretty much anything with it. And we went through a couple of calculations, a couple of examples uh, last time on computing moments of Brownian motion, the moments of it squared, and so on. And I wanted to, before um, going on to doing some more moments, one thing that I didn't do last time is, is sort of show you what many sample paths look like. I kind of sketched it, and maybe I'll sketch it again, and then I'll implement it and, and show you, because it's, it's sort of a, an important feature. So if you just generate a sample path from the Brownian motion, we, kn we all kind of know what it looks like. It's some sort of process that looks like that. Uh, and if you generated many of these sample paths, you'll see eventually, because of this property, because of the property that the Brownian motion is normally distributed with mean zero and variance t, if you generate many of them, you'll find that, that most of the paths lie in this sort of, um, in this envelope. And this envelope here is a curve that is minus square root t and plus square root t. And you can, of course, have a couple of other standard deviations. This would be the one standard deviation. So you'd have about, what, 67% of the paths that would lie within this cone. And if you did plus or minus 2, sig two square root t, then you'd find that about 90% of the path and 95% of the paths are, are inside of that cone. And if you did plus or minus 3, you'd find, you know, whatever it is, 99 point something percent of the paths are in that cone. So I'll show you what that looks like um, numerically. Uh, and... Um, but uh, before, before going there, I still want to remind you of other, other main features. Uh, the other, other feature that we observed is that if you, if you just take a single path and compute the total variation of a Brownian motion, do you remember what the result was? So if you basically kind of compute the total length of the path. So the idea was that the Brownian motion is wiggling around far too quickly, and those increments add up Sorry, those increments don't actually converge when you add them up. It becomes infinite. And there was another important property that we demonstrated. So the total variation along any path is infinite. And, sorry, and as well, we looked at this idea of the quadratic variation of the Brownian motion. And we demonstrated that this was what? It was T, almost surely. Okay. Now, what we actually proved in class is convergence in L2, but you can show that uh, for those who want, I can show you how there's a subsequence in which it does also converge almost shortly. And um, so we, sh we sh showed these results along an individual path, and it didn't matter which path you took, but if you take a sample over many, many, many paths, then we also said if you look at, say, the distribution at one point in time, at one fixed t, then because of this property number two, the variance of those paths, the variance of those endpoints of those paths is t as well. But those t's, the variance of the Brownian motion at a particular, the variance of, of the Brownian motion at a point in time being equal to t is quite of a different nature than the quadratic variation being equal to t. 
Okay, remember the quadratic variation is going to be true for any path of the Brownian motion. While the variance, in order for you to look at the variance, you actually have to simulate many paths and look at the endpoint. So these are quite different objects, although the result is the same thing. Okay, so I just wanted to do a quick little computer experiment to try to ground the theory that we're doing um, to demonstrate this, uh, this envelope that I mentioned there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is create, again, another uh, piece of code that's going to generate many sample paths. So we'll have a bunch of little random variables, and let's say, let's do this over one year. Let's say the number of steps that we take is, I don't know, um, 500. And the number of paths that we'll generate, let's take 1,000 for now. So I'm going to create some random number that's going to be, number of rows is going to be the number of simulations I've got. The columns are going to be the time steps. And uh, in fact, I only need NDT of them. And then we'll store that in this little variable called W. Okay, and I'm going to do this not in the most efficient way, but in a way that is easy to understand. So we'll step over through time. I, is, I equals 1 is the first step, I equals 2 is the second step, I equals 3 is the third step, etc. So I'll make the Brownian motion for all scenarios at the current, actually from time step 2, to, because Matrix, or I, sh I should say these are indices starting from 1. So t equals 0 is actually i equals 1. Okay, t equals delta t is i equals 2. So I'm going to start from i equals 2. So it, the Brownian motion is equal to what it was before, plus we have to increment, we have to basically take uh, a normal random variable. And you know what? To make it really simple, let me remove it from there, and I'll just put it in here. We'll take a normal random sample, and we'll have n simulations of those things. And this is supposed to be scaled by square root of dt. Okay, so this here, what I've highlighted, is the increment of the Brownian motion over time step from time step i minus 1 to time step i. And we know that the increment of the Brownian motion is normal with mean 0 and variance delta t. So that, what I've highlighted, generates exactly that. It generates a normal with mean 0 and variance delta t. The function rand n generates standard normals. So this is like the z that we usually often use for standard normals. Okay, so this will generate me many, many sample paths. And then at the end of it, I'll simply plot these things. And I think I need to put a dt here. t divided by n dt. Okay. So we'll plot them with time on one axis and then the Brownian motion there. And let's hopefully that runs. Um, simulate Brownian path. Okay, good. There we go. So that's a thousand sample paths. And you can see visually this idea that I was telling you about, this little envelope that, that uh, the paths are contained within. Uh, to make that envelope even more obvious, I can just put in a little bit, a little formula in here. In fact, why don't I say, call that vector t. We can put in something which is going to give me a line that's square root of t, plus and minus, and um, these will get, be our to stand, did they make an error? Oh no, it's already run. Okay, I don't know if the black line doesn't show up that well there, does it? Um, maybe red will work. Ugh, <laughs> that's worse. Okay, I know one one potential way to do this a little bit better. Okay. Okay, I think you can see it um, more strongly there. And then if I did plus or minus two 
standard deviations, then we'll get most of the paths in that interval. There we go. So you can see that's about 90% of the paths are in there. There's about 10% that come outside. Okay, and like I said, if you look at this variance of the terminal, at, actually let's take the variance at time t equals 0.8 for the sample paths. Okay? So we know if I take the Brownian motion, all scenarios at 0.8, I've taken how many steps here? 500? So 0.8 would be at step number 400, right? So it should really be 401. So this will give me all of the results that occurred at the time slice t equals 0.8. And if I compute the variance of this, what should I receive? What should I find as my result? Should be about 0.8, right? And simulation error. It's about 0.76. It's not too bad. If I ran it again, that's a thousand scenarios. You can actually compute what your error should be. Right? You're all statisticians, or you've done a lot of stats. You've got a thousand scenarios from something that's normally distributed. It's actually been summed up from a bunch of individual normals. And you should be able to compute what the standard error is and whether this is in that confidence interval. Do you reject whether or not this variance actually is 0.8? Right? It's a test that you can all do. I'm not going to ask you to do it here, but it's something that you should all have the technology to do. Let's go at a half. Let's check it a half. So we have, again, 200, uh, 500 steps, so that's 251. And that's about a half. That one's even closer. Let's take 0.9. Why not? Um, 0.9 times 500 plus 1. It's 0.88. Right? So it's pretty close. So we can see the scenarios are, in fact, giving us reasonably close results to what the theory should be. The more sample paths we produce, the more accurate we will get the answer. So let's say uh, 100,000 paths. Now, I think MATLAB should not be, um, should be able to, to handle plotting 100,000. It's the plotting that actually takes the longest time. The scenario generation was very quick. Mm. OK. Caught unexpected exception. Yeah, so it's got too many. Um, too many paths, it can't do it, can't plot it. And I've crashed my MATLAB. <laughs> okay, oh, it had it, did you see that? It flashed on the screen, it disappeared. Let's do 10,000, it, sh it should have no problem with 10,000. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now of course it's much more densely packed as we can see, and let's, I don't know, let's just double check uh, a couple of these results. So say at, um, at t equals 0.9 again. Now we're, well, 0.883, still, hmm, I'm surprised <laughs> that it didn't, it didn't improve a huge amount. Well, okay, how should the error go, by the way? What should it scale by as I increase paths? If I multiply, if I wanted to get a factor of 10 times more accurate. My confidence interval to shrink by 10. How many more samples would I actually have to generate? 100 times more, right? Confidence interval square, scale by square roots because variances, independent, they are linear. So in order for me to reduce my con, so here I've increased the con, I've increased the paths by 10 times so I'm only going to get an increase in accuracy by square root of 10. So that's why it's not a huge change. In any case, I think this, this, uh, this is enough to serve the purpose of illustration. Any questions about this little sample generation? No? Okay. Good. So let's go back to the, uh, to the board here. Uh, what, that one, of the thing, one of the other things I wanted to do is um, to talk about how to connect this Brownian motion back to some of the financial models that we were looking at before. We did discuss one, um, one connection, and that was we said if we looked at the CRR model and we took its continuous time limit, we know we get this log normal distribution for the, for the terminal asset price, and in fact the increments were independent, they were stationary, they're normally distributed if we look at the log of the stock price. So in fact, the thing that drives the asset price dynamics in the continuous time limit 
of the CRR model is a Brownian motion. Right? We sort of saw that development in, in the last class. So what I'd like to do is sit here is say, suppose we simply just started off and I told you, let's model directly in continuous time. Forget about starting in discrete and going to some sort of limit. I could simply write down a model to say, let the asset price be equal to this, e to the mu minus a half sigma squared t plus sigma wt. And w is a Brownian motion. Now, we all know from earlier discussions when we talk about processes and, and, and probabilities and so on, we have to be careful about what probability space we're using, what probability measure in particular. So when we're thinking about asset dynamics, I should be, be a little bit special and say that this is a P Brownian motion. So it's a Brownian motion when we use real world probabilities. Okay. When we discussed Brownian motion last class, I said forget about the measure because we're working only under one measure, one probability measure. But when we do asset pricing and you, you want to look at derivative valuation, there are always two, or at least two measures around, the real world one and at least one risk neutral. So here, when I write down this model, I should specify that this is in fact uh, a P Brownian motion and my asset price can be written in this form. And you can ask yourself, well, does this correspond to the CRR model that we had before? And what's your answer? Does it? How would you answer the question even? Oh, well, you'd look up at the exponential. You know in the CRR model, the distributional property, that's what you mainly had. You had this fact. You said that ST equaled, let's say, let's put a little note here, from CRR as N increased up to infinity. We had S at any particular point in time. We usually used capital T because we were always interested in the maturity of an option. But here we can pick any fixed point in time, little t. We showed that that was equal in distribution. to this expression here. And we can then ask, well, does the model above, does this model have the same property as that model? OK? Oh, yeah, there's F0 everywhere here. Yeah, thank you. There's our initial asset price. OK, yeah, it's not just normalized by one. So we can ask, well, do those things have the same, same property? It's impossible to go from the second line to the first one because the second, the second line, the one where the arrow is there, is a distribution. You cannot go from just a distribution to an entire stochastic process unless you make additional assumptions. So what we can at least do is see whether the Brownian motion um, driving asset price in the box actually has the same distribution as the CRR limit. And hopefully you can all answer that in a split second, right? You look at it and you say, well, in order for me to check, all I really need to do is check this part and this part because that's just an exponential transformation. So if I check the exponent of my exponentials, I'll match. And then I also realize, well, clearly, clearly these two things are the same. So there's nothing to check there. Therefore, all I need to do is check to see whether those two have the same distribution. And by definition, W is a Brownian motion, so we know it is normal with mean zero and variance T. And what I've underlined in, this, in the CRR model is, again, normal with mean zero and variance sigma squared T. Since I've multiplied by sigma in the original model, in the, in the continuous time model, I can see that those things match. The variance of sigma w is, or the distribution of sigma w is, this is normal mean zero variance sigma squared t, and so is the, the expression that we got from the CRR. So these are definitely the same thing, and we can start directly in continuous time. Now, uh, there, was a, there was a question on your term test, the very last question, where I asked you to show in the CRR model when you took a limit that the joint distribution of the asset 
viewed at two points in time was something, right? Do you remember that question? Not a whole lot of you attempted it. I would say about half of you attempted it and, and less than that achieved the goal. Um, but you can actually, we can ask that, que that question again now in the continuous time setting and you probably will all be able to get the answer much more easily. So let me pose a question here and say, what is the joint distribution of S at T1 and S at T2? Because we know what the distribution is at a single point in time. What is it at, at two points in time? Well, one way to answer this question is to simply write out S at T1 and S at T2 in terms of that Brownian motion, and then we'll see the question boils down to some uh, boils down to a question about the, the features of the Brownian motion itself. So S at T1 is simply that. And S at T2 is this. There's no, I mean, I just replaced little t by T1 and little t by T2. Now, actually, before going further, one thing you, I hope you do notice one main difference between the CRR model and what we've written in the box. Notice in the CRR model, when we took this limit, what we demonstrated were distributional properties of the asset price. What we have in the box is a pathwise um, property of the asset price. Notice that the equality in the box is not equal in distribution. It's the definition of S in terms of the entire path of W. And I hope you know the, the, the difference between the two, right? One is telling you, how S at a fixed point in time is distributed. The other one, that's the CRR going and going to infinity. That's telling us how S at a fixed point in time is distributed. Log normal with those properties there. The, the other equation in terms of the Brownian motion actually tells me how S evolves and gets to that point. The entire evolution. And those are quite different objects. Okay, so um, just be aware of that. So that's why in this equation, these two equations here for T1 and T2, I'm allowed to simply write equality there and I don't have to put equal in distribution. They are simply equal. And it's the same Brownian motion that is showing up here. Right? It's just one single Brownian motion because we look at the entire path. Again, if I sketch that out for you, I can say here's T1, Here's T2. There's some sort of sample path of the Brownian motion. And I'm asking about how is that point and that point jointly distributed? Okay, that's my Brownian motion that's driving everything. I exponentiate it. Or I, first of all, I multiply by sigma. I add mu minus a half sigma squared times T. I exponentiate it, multiply it by S0. That gives me my asset price path. Right? That's what the formula at the top of the screen is, is telling me. So I'm asking about the joint behavior of those two things, and, and I think right away you, you realize that to describe the joint behavior of this asset at these two points in time, all I need is to know how does, how do these two things up in the exponential um, behave? What is the joint behavior of those two expressions up in the exponential? So in other words, I already know right off the bat, it's log something. Right? S of T1, S of T2 are jointly log something. And we just need to ask, well, what is a something? Well, if we look at the two exponentials, we realize that uh, certainly they have to be normal because each term in that exponential is just normal random variable in terms of distribution, right? Because now I'm, ask, I'm asking it about a distribution property so I can actually talk about distributions and not pathwise behavior anymore. So I know that this is normal and the other thing is normal and in fact they're jointly normal because they're driven by the same underlying Brownian motion. So this process or this asset price, if I take the log relative to S0, 
I already know this is going to be normal with some mean and some covariance structure here. Right? I've, I already know that for free, basically. I've done no work. All I do is I simply observe the fact that, well, the exponential is the Brownian motion plus some deterministic thing, so therefore the exponentials have to be jointly normal. And then the only remaining tasks are to figure out the means and the variances. Well, the means are trivial here, right? The mean of the log of that first term there is, uh, is just mu minus a half sigma squared times T1. And the mean for the second process is mu minus a half sigma squared times T2. That's pretty straightforward. And to figure out the covariance structure, I simply have to compute, well, I have to compute the covariances, right? All of pairwise covariances. So what's the corollary? What's the um, sigma 1, 1? That's the variance of sigma T1, or sorry, sigma WT1, right? Capital sigma 1, 1 is identical to the variance of sigma WT1 because we just have plus a constant as far as the variance is concerned up in the exponential. And that's sigma squared T1 by definition, right, of a Brownian motion. Sigma 2, 2 is similarly, that's just the variance of little sigma WT2, which again, by definition of Brownian motion, it's that. So the only real difficult part, and it's not actually very difficult at all, is the, um, co the covariance terms. And of course, covariances are symmetric, so I just need to compute one of them. They're equal. And that's the covariance of sigma WT1 and sigma WT2. So we can do a quick little calculation. That's sigma squared expected value WT1, WT2, minus the product of the individual expectations, but actually if you remember the result from last class, we could have gone straight to the answer, but it's worthwhile deriving again. Okay, these are each zero because they're Brownian motions. And how do I compute this expectation? We have the Brownian motion at two different points in time. T2 is bigger than T1, right? I mean, I didn't actually specify that here, but I should have. T2 is bigger than T1, kind of the obvious choice. How do you compute that expectation? Yeah, exactly. Use the incremental property, right? Use the independence of increments. So this is WT1 minus the increment WT1, T2 minus WT1. And that equals, well, the product of the first term, WT1 squared, expected value, that's T1, isn't it? And then we have expected value of WT1 times the increment from T1 to T2. Those are independent. We can therefore write that as the product of the expectations, and that's zero. So I'll just write in that extra step for you because now remember we're only allowed to say that this is the expected value of the product because those two terms are independent. I'll mention again, I've seen many times in, 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 in exam situations students making the mistake of saying the expected value of the product of two things is always equal to the expected value sorry, is always equal to the product of their expectation. That's not true. It's only true if the two objects are independent of one another. Okay. And this is the case. Okay, so we can say independence because of independence. So our final result is, is quite easy. Um, sigma one, two, is sigma squared T1. Okay, so now we, we've got everything. We actually have it all. I'll, I'll just summarize it again here. 
So we have log ST1 over S0, log ST2 over S0. This is normal mu minus a half sigma squared T1, mu minus a half sigma squared T2. And um, we could even factor out, well, I'll leave it like this, sigma squared T1, sigma squared T1, sigma squared T1, sigma squared T2. So if you were to write, if you were to compute the correlation, what would the correlation be? It would be the covariance, which we just computed, divided by the square root of the product of the variance, right? Which is sigma squared T1 times sigma squared T2 square root. And you can see that that is T1 over T2 square root. And that was basically the result that you had to show on the term test, except I asked it under the risk neutral measure. So instead of mu minus a half sigma squared, we had R minus a half sigma squared. Okay, but here we can do the calculation and the derivation directly in continuous time. In the term test, you had to go back to the discrete time and take limits, okay? Because at that point, that was your, the technology you had. Now you have a little bit more. Okay, any questions about this little derivation here? Okay, I want to go back um, to this calculation that we just did of the expected value of WT1 times WT2. So we just did this calculation by, look, by using the independence of increments idea. Does anyone have another idea of how you could efficiently compute that expectation? There's another property, not, not just a property of Brownian motion, the property of expectation. Then you can use a property of Brownian motion. Conditioning, okay? Iterated conditional expectation. I, I could, in principle, also write this as the expected value of, of the expected value, WT1, WT2, conditional on knowing what WT1 is. Right? I'm always allowed to do that. I'm always allowed to do an iterated expectation where I give myself more information in the inner expectation, and that's the whole idea. Right? We've used this kind of trick before in the context of finance with these forward starting options. Right? You might remember those examples when we had the asset prices. So here we can also use it for Brownian motions as well. And uh, the advantage here is, is becomes, quite clear, becomes clear quite quickly. First of all, the WT1, well, you're conditioning on it. So in fact, in that inner expectation, it's not even random it can come out of that expectation. And so you have this iterated expectation and the, the problem then reduces to, well, what is that? Now you could use the independence of increments, if you like, for the Brownian motion, but you don't even have to do that. You can just say, well, a Brownian motion, we know distributionally it's, uh, it's stationary, right? So we know that WT2 equals the, the distribute. If I know where WT1 is, if I know where I am at WT1, from there onwards, there are many possible outcomes, right? And that would be the W at time T2 what would be the expected value at WT2? It's where it started, right? This expected value is, in fact, just WT1. Brownian, the stationarity idea that if I, stop, if I start the process at its current point and I only look at its future, it looks exactly the same as a Brownian motion. It just happens to start at its current location. Right? That's where we can just use stationarity. Okay, so that, in fact, is WT1. And so you see you end up with the expected value of WT1 squared, which is T1. So you get the same answer. 
as you had better, right? We know that otherwise we made a mistake. Okay, so I just wanted to point out that you can also do the calculation that way. And sometimes iterated expectations are easier than, than looking at the increments. And it really will depend on a case-by-case -case basis and you'll always get the right answer using one method or another method. Right? There's no, no way that you'd, you'd make a mistake. Okay, to, get you, to give um, a little more, bit more exercise in, in Brownian motion, let's do a couple of other calculations. How would you do the variance of WT, WT plus S? So these are just computations. It's useful to do once you see them once. You can do a lot of these types of things. What would be the approach? Well, as always with variances, it's better to write it as an expectation of the objects that you need. So you know that this is going to be the expected value of this product squared minus the expected value of this product all squared. We've just computed this, right? We've actually just done it. T1 is equal to little t, T2 is equal to T plus S. Because right? S and T are positive here. So what's the answer to this, to this one? It's just little t, right? That's kind of the nice thing. If you look at the expected value of a product of Brownian motions at two different points in time, it's just equal to the shorter point in time, always. Okay, so that's T. So the hard part is computing this expectation, but we can use exactly the same tricks that we've got already in our toolbox. So let's uh, do that as a side calculation. And I'll, I'll, I might as well just use the increment version of things, and then you can try using iterated expectations as, a, as your own little exercise. So I can write it as WT plus WT plus S minus WT, and this whole thing is squared. Hope I have enough brackets there. No. And then let's multiply the WT. Well, we have a WT squared because of the square, uh, the term out front. And then we have the square of the sum of those two terms, which is W squared plus twice W, T, times the increment, plus the square of that increment. Okay, so all I've done there is simply expanded the square. So at first you might have looked at it and thought, oh geez, it looks, like, looks kind of scary. But actually it's not too bad when you get through the details. So what's the first term? You have W squared times W squared. What's that expected value? Remember? Yeah, good memory. It's 3T squared. Okay, expected value of WT squared. What about the second, the middle term there? We have expected value of WT cubed times um, the increment of W. It's zero. Why is it zero? Because, well, you've got a function of WT times the increment of WT, times the increment, sorry, from T forward. So those are independent. So you can write as a product of their expectations. The expected value of the increment is zero, you're done. In fact, the expected value of the cube of the Brownian motion is also zero. So both terms are zero. So let me just write that extra term in here and um, a few lines just for the purpose of clarity and when you look back at the notes. So it's this, and that particular term there, this is the same as expected value WT cubed times the expected value of WT plus S minus WT. And each of these are zero. It so happens. It's not, it wouldn't always be the case that you have both terms being zero, but we do happen to have that in this case.
Okay, and what about the last term? Mm. Yeah, that's right. It's S times T. So, once again, we have this independence property that we're going to use. So let's be put in a little more detail again. So we've got independence of this is independent of that. Right, those are independent. Any function of W, this independence of increment, by the way, doesn't apply just to W at the increment of W alone and then the increment of W alone at, at two other points in time. Any function of the increment of W from T2 to T1 and any other function of the increment of W from T3 to T4 will have to also be independent. Right? That in, that they inherit those properties. Once you have independence of the underlying randomness, any function of that underlying randomness will also be independent. So that's what I'm using here. Right? That's sort of a basic property of probability. Okay, and this is T, and this is S. So it's kind of interesting that before we found the expected value doesn't depend on S, but the variance does. The expected value of that product doesn't depend, but the variance does depend on S. And our final result, 3T squared plus T times S. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions about this? All right, so before we go for our first break, I want to talk a little bit again, coming back to finance motivation, I want to talk about correlated Brownian motions. Okay. So when you think about, okay, so what is, correlate, what, what is the motivation to discuss correlated Brownian motions? If you think about the financial context, if you look at two assets, two assets, you know, IBM and um, Amazon. Okay. Completely different industry sectors, but they could perhaps be correlated in some way. Perhaps more IBM and Microsoft are probably more strongly correlated. And those asset dynamics, the returns are going to be correlated in some way, and so we want to translate that, that sort of concept of correlation of the asset prices back in terms of the under, underlying fundamental uncertainty, which is the Brownian motion. So the way that you can correlate Brownian motions, the easiest, um, the easiest construction is to say, suppose I have two, <coughs> excuse me, two independent Brownian motions. So what do I mean by independent Brownian, two independent Brownian motions? Suppose this and this. Okay. So. Independent Brownian motions are Brownian motions that have zero, that, that have no relationship to one another. The one can go up or down independently of the other. It's just obvious, simple understanding of what you mean by independence. In terms of distributional properties, we can think of these as, um, in the same way, jointly, we can define them in exactly the same way and same procedure as what we had before. So those are zero, those are zero. We can say that, um, WT, WT perp, because we need to describe the joint dynamics. This is normal. Instead of just being normal zero with variance T, it's normal zero, um, zero, zero, because it's a bivariate object, has variance T, but covariances are zero. So for normal random variables, all you have to define are the covariances. So we'd want this to be our basic property, our basic distributional property. And as well, the little, the little sign up here, this is a perp sign, perpendicular, okay? So orthogonal, independent. Uh, but you still want to have these other properties that you have the increments are independent and stationary.
WT and WT perp have. And in particular, we also have to describe something about the joint increments, right? So I'm going to draw two timelines for you here. And let's say we look at some, over, some sequence of intervals. So this is time, this is both time. And I'm thinking of this as one brown in motion, and this as uh, the timeline for the other brown. They're, of course, running on the same time, but I've just separated because I want to talk about this kind of correlation structure that we see. So if we just focus on one Brownian motion, and I ask about the correlation, um, I ask about the, the dependence between this interval and that interval. What is it? Their independence of so the correlation would be zero, correct? So similarly here, the correlation between these two are also going to be zero just by definition, basically that's what we mean by, by uh, independence of increments. But what we also mean by the fact that W is bivariate normal with zero covariance is that if we look at the correlation between these assets, this is also zero. Even if the, even if the time interval is the same. So the increment of W over time T1 to T2 is also independent of the increment of W perp from T1 to T2. Okay, so you want to have independence across there. As well, because uh, uh, W perp has independence of increments, so if I take T1 to T2 and then T3 to T4, certainly for W perp, those increments are independent, but also T1 to T2 increments of W is independent of the increment T3 to T4 from W perp. So you also have these sort of cross diagonals that are also zero correlations. So you have zero everywhere here in this little diagram. So this is how we build up our, our, um, our Brownian motion, um, our bivariate Brownian motions that are independent. And paths, again, are continuous. Now you might be asking, how can I create this from um, from a little tree. Remember when we started the Brownian motion, we had a nice little model for how you could, how you could take uh, a, a model where we took steps of square root delta t, and we put probabilities one half on these things, and then we saw in the limit as delta t went down to zero, this, this type of stepping ended up producing our, our Brownian motion. Right, do you remember that? That was what we did last lecture. So, you know, you could pose the same problem. What, how, what would be the fundamental tree that produces this bivariate independent Brownian motion? Anyone have an idea? What you might do? Okay, I'll start drawing it out because it's not entirely obvious. Well, what you need is, you basically need two, dimen you need two dimensions. You, you can't just use one dimension, one space dimension. There's always time horizontally, right? You can't just use one space dimension. You need two to keep track of both processes. So the idea is you start off at a point here, and this is the point zero, zero for WT and W perp. And after one time step, it's going to be a little bit difficult to draw this. So bear with me, I'll, I'll erase several times. I suggest you don't copy until I've got it right. And perhaps even then, don't bother, just get it from the web. Okay. So then, um, I'm, then from there, we're going to draw four outcomes. Okay. You go up by square root delta t in both assets. You go down by square root delta t in, sorry, both processes. You go up in square root delta t in one process and down in the other. Those are the four outcomes that you've got. So you connect from there to there, from there to there, from there to, actually let's put it, I'm going to extend that line a little bit more, to there, and from there to there. Okay, so these are the four 
That's a plane that I've drawn there, okay? Those are the four points that you move to. And uh, if I want to put some little labels on here, I'll do it like this. This is square root delta t, square root delta t. Actually, I think in usual notation that would be minus, right? Because as you go into the board, you go negative in, in, in that direction. Here, you'd have square root delta t, square root delta t. Both, at, both processes went up. Here, you'd have um, square, root, um, yeah, square root delta t, and then, actually, that's minus square root delta t, square root delta t. That asset went down. And over here, I would be minus square root delta t, minus square root delta t. Okay, and these branches all occur with probability. What? They want to be independent, so they should all have equally equal likelihood of occurring. Exactly. All with probability one quarter. One quarter. Uh, I won't bother writing it all out. They're all one quarter. Okay. Now, what where it gets interesting is what happens in the next step. Okay. That's where the mess starts to happen. Okay. So again, bear with me for a second. So if you think about it, in each direction, you should have a recombining tree, right? If I take a slice in one direction, if I take a slice in this vertical direction, we should have a tree that looks just like our, our, our good old um, binomial tree going up and down by square root delta t. So I need this to occur both in, 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 in the direction of, of process one and in the direction of process two. So what happens at the next time slice is you actually have nine points. Okay. So you have a point, uh, and let's start drawing it here. One, mm. one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And uh, let's focus on what happens with this particular node here. So that guy is going to go there, 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 and there. Okay. So you can see at each point you emanate four points. Okay. You go up or down in all possible pairs. The next node, let's say this one, is going to go here, 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 and there, okay? Then, uh, green, I guess, is my next choice of color here. This is going to connect there, 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 and there. And it's already looking, it's already kind of hard to look at, isn't it? Do, should I bother right drawing the last one? It's okay like this? And you know where the last one connects, right? It's these last, uh, maybe I'll just uh, circle them in yellow. That point connects to this one, this one, this one, and this one. Okay? Those four. So you're able to span all possible combinations. And you can imagine, you can see, Hopefully you can convince yourself that if you restrict yourself to any sort of plane, you see a little recombining tree in there. Right? If you restrict yourself to any plane, there's a, there's a recombining tree. And I, used, I have a piece of code which demonstrated this for me. And I was looking for it earlier. Oh, plot grid. It might be this. No, it's not that one. Okay, if I find it for you, I'll, I'll, I'll post it. Okay, I'll post a little movie so that you can see what I, what I have as a piece of code which generates this for several steps and you can look at it as it moves around and see the shape. But it's always a recombining tree in every slice. Okay, so this is our underlying, this is our underlying model that's going to span and then when you take the limit as delta t goes to zero, it's going to produce two processes or a joint pair, a pair of processes that have exactly this property, these properties here. And we'll use these uncorrelated Brownian motions to build correlated Brownian motions 
which will then be used to drive asset prices that are correlated. Okay? That's what our goal will be. Questions? Okay, let's take a little break then. Okay, so we'll continue on here. Let me remind you once again, we are talking about this idea of correlated Brownian motions, and in order for us to, in order for us to, to generate uh, correlated Brownian motions, which are going to drive asset prices that are correlated, we need to first talk about how to generate or how to define independent Brownian motions. And this was a construction that, uh, that we went through. Here's a tree that allows us to create a process that has those properties. And now I'd like to tell you of how you can use those processes to build um, correlated Brownian motions. So suppose I gave you, to, to answer the question, how do you get the correlated Brownian motions, suppose I gave you, first of all, two independent normal random variables. How would you create two normal random variables that are standard, so independent normal, standard, standard normal, let's say. How would I create two random variables, x and y, that are jointly normal, still mean zero, variances are one because we standardize it, but they have a correlation of rho. How would I do that? Any takers? So this has nothing to do with Brownian motions. It's purely just two random variables. I want to make them correlated. And in fact, not just make them correlated, but I want to make them jointly normal. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So if I took, um, let's solve it sort of uh, generally. Suppose I took x to be z. Okay, so then x is standard normal by definition, and y to be a linear combination of z and z perp. Now, since x and y are both built out of these normal random variables, they're also going to be jointly normal, and the only issue is what's their mean and what's their variance and what's the covariance that will fully specify the distribution. So we already know the mean of x. The mean, uh, we know that x is, is normal 0, 1. What about y? Well, the mean of y is also zero, right, because it's a linear combination of standard normals. The variance of y, on the other hand, is what? It's a squared plus b squared, right, because you've got the variance of a squared times the variance of z plus b squared times the variance of z perp plus 2ab, the covariance, but the covariance is zero because z and z perp are independent. So you've got that. Well, we want that to be 1, don't we? According to the question that I've posed, we want the variance of y to be 1. So we've got one constraint. And our second constraint comes from making the covariance of x and y be equal to rho. So what is the covariance here? It's just a, in fact, isn't it? If, just to be really pedantic about it, let's say that z that's az plus bz perp, which is a covariance of z with z times a, because the covariance is linear in each argument, plus b times a covariance of z and z perp. And that's just a. Okay. And we want that to be equal to rho. So actually, we already know what a has to be. a has to be rho. Therefore, b has to be the square root of 1 minus rho squared. Mm, why don't I put both together? This achieves the goal. 
So we now know how to take independent standard normal random variables and create correlated and jointly um, normally distributed standardized normal random variables. Okay, that's our simple way to do it. It's not the only way. You could actually also make X a linear combination of Z and Z perp as well. And there's some extra degree of freedom in that. And there's some advantage to doing it. Okay, well, with that little bit of uh, backstory, how do you think we can create correlated Brownian motions? Let's call them correlated Brownian motions X and Y out of the uncorrelated ones. Well, it seems natural to just define them in exactly the same way that we define the linear combination for the, um, uh, for the random variables. So we can simply say X is one of those Brownian motions and Y is another linear combination and we'll choose exactly the same linear combination because we know that the distributional properties are going to pre be preserved in this manner. Right, so if we, if we make this definition, we can see that XT is certainly normal. Actually, we can look at the joint behavior. We know that XT, YT, jointly, it's normal with mean zeros and variance is T and T. And the covariance, well, we just did the covariance calculation. So we know it's just rho times the variance of W. So that's rho times T. Okay, if that's a little bit quick for you, just go through the step and double check that that is in fact the case. So XT, YT are jointly normal with this covariance structure. We also, with, this, and with that definition, we also can easily check that XT and YT are stationary and independent. Are, well, they're stationary and XT and YT individually are stationary and independent. But bivariately they are not independent. So let me be careful about that statement. So I'm going to write it separate, I'm going to write this in two separate statements. This is stationary or has stationary and independent increments. So these property is just inherited by the fact that W is and YT also has stationary and independent increments, which again is inherited by the property of both W and W perp. Okay? W and W perp are stationary and independent, so their linear combination must also be stationary and independent. There's no way that you can introduce um, a non-stationarity by taking that linear combination. But X and Y are not independent as processes. So I'm going to draw the same correlation diagram that I had before when we took two times. So these are times here. And this will be for the increment of the X process, the increment of the Y process. And we've got two intervals here. So we look at the increment of X in this interval, increment of Y in that inter interval. And we do have the property that this correlation is zero and that correlation is zero, but we also have still that this correlation is zero and this correlation is zero because these are two non-overlapping intervals in time. You can actually prove that result, right? You can use the definition of W and just prove that the increment of X over, say, over this interval is independent of the increment of y over that interval. Right. Do, you, do you think you can do that proof on your own? No? Come on. You should be able to do it. X and y are linear combinations of w. You know the properties that w has of w and w perp. w and w perp are independent increments. So 
I'm going to have an independence of increments for x's and y's as well. But, so I'll leave it open for you to do. Try it on your own. Okay? What about this correlation? The increment over that interval. So the correlation will be rho. And the correlation of these two will also be rho. And how would I check that? I simply go back to this definition of x and y in terms of the w's. And I say, look at the increment of w. Oh, sorry, x. Look at the increment of y. Compute their covariance. Their variances are each t. Right? The variance of x is t. The variance of y is t. Straightforward. The covariance, in fact, we have it in front of you. It's rho times t. When you look at any interval, any, any fixed t. And so their correlation will be rho. Rho times t divided by the square root of t times t. Right? So that's how we get our correlation. So this correlation structure is, is a little bit different than what we had for the underlying Brownian motion. Here we have zeros everywhere, the uncorrelated Brownian motions. But we can take those and create this type of correlation structure. And this is exactly what we want for a financial model as an underlying dynamics. Because if you think about it, uh, what, does, what will the increment of this process over that time and this time represent? It'll somehow represent the returns of one asset and the returns of another asset. And if you look at the returns over the same time span, those assets may be correlated. But if you look at returns over different time spans, they should be uncorrelated, right? This is the efficient market hypothesis, basically. The fact that you cannot predict future returns based on past returns. Okay? So that's why this, this, this type of structure where you have zero correlations once you look at increments over, over distinct points in time, over, over non-overlapping points in time, those correlations have to be zero. But correlations within the same time may not be zero. Okay? That's a big, important point. And that's what you need to take away from that picture. Is that correlations over distinct points in time, non-overlapping, are always zero, no matter what, no, even if the underlying Brownian motions are correlated. But correlations over the same interval in time, they can be non-zero. And this is an example of how that happens. Okay, so let's do a couple of little calculations on these basic processes, all right? So suppose I, was, I were asking you to compute the correlation of the increment of, so X and Y are correlated Brownian motions with correlation rho. That's what this means. Okay, these are correlated Brownian motions and you call, and rho is the correlation, of course. There's not much to say about that. It, it just is. And I wanted to look at the covariance between X at time uh, T plus S minus xt, or the covariance, sorry, between t plus x minus xt and y t plus u minus yt. So this is an overlapping point in time, and I'm going to, and I want uh, to have the following ordering. I want t to be smaller than t plus s to be smaller than t plus u. So if we look at this on timeline, here's some time t, here's t plus s, and there's t plus u. And I'm asking about the, the covariance of the increment of x over this interval and the increment of y over the larger interval. Okay? So these are not independent pieces, right? They're, they can't be independent because times are overlapping. How would you approach that? Right? Always the same idea. Look at breaking it up in terms of the increments. 
This is one way, and then the other way is through iterated expectations, right? Writing out the expectation form. So I could always think of the increment of y from t to t plus s, and then from t plus s to t plus u. Then I can use independence of the second part of that increment. Right? I know that this, the increment of x over here is certainly independent of the increment of y over there. Okay, those are independent. And from that diagram above, I also know that the correlation over here is just rho. Right, it's exactly the same time frame, so the correlation is rho. So what's the covariance then? Without even doing any mathematics, we can tell the answer, right? Just by drawing a simple diagram. And then we can work it out with the math, but what, what's the answer for the correlation? For the covariance, sorry. It will be rho times s. Right? The size of that window is s. The correlation is rho, so it's rho times s. Okay, so let's work it out explicitly. So let's just call this thing c. So c equals covariance of x plus s minus xt so y plus t plus u minus y t plus s minus y t plus s minus y t. Right? I've done nothing. I've simply added and subtracted. Um, sorry, plus <laughs> sign. I've added and subtracted y t plus s. And then this is a covariance of the two terms. Uh, y t plus s minus y t, actually t plus u, sorry, minus y t plus s, if I keep the ordering the same, plus covariance of x t plus s minus x t, y t plus s minus y t. Independence of increments tell me this is zero. Okay, those are non-overlapping intervals. Stationarity of increments tells me that this is the same thing as the covariance of x at time s and y at time s. That's stationary. And then the definition, basically, of the property of this covariance is that it's rho times s. Alternatively, actually, let's write it back in terms of the underlying Brownian motions. That would be ws semicolon rho ws plus 1 minus rho squared square root ws perp. Right? In terms of the underlying Brownian motions that are uncorrelated. This is far more detail than, than, you, than you will need later on. For now, you, you might need it, but later on you'll realize this is just a waste of time <laughs> going through all these steps. Okay. That's it. So that's our result. Rho times S, as I said above. Okay. Questions about the calculation? Okay, so let's do something a little harder then. Let's look at um, the variance of x at time t and y at time t. It's a little bit harder, not a whole lot. So how would I do this computation? Write it in terms of the definition, right? This is the expected value of the square of that thing. 
minus the square of the expected, sorry, minus the, um, yeah, square of the expected value. Okay, so we need to do a couple of side calculations. We need to compute the expected value of x times y. And what's that equal to? Okay. Not quite, almost. It's rho times t, but the way that you can do it is always, you could always fall back if you, if you, if you still have trouble, which it will take a little while for you to immediately see the answers. Uh, but you could always write back, go back and write x and y in terms of the uncorrelated Brownian motions. Then things are always easy. It's longer because you have more arithmetic to do, but it's always straightforward because you understand the uncorrelated Brownian motion case well. So you take x is w and y is rho w plus 1 minus rho squared wt perp, and that's equal to rho expected value of wt squared plus 1 minus rho squared square root wt, wt perp. And these are independent, right? w and w perp are independent by definition. Therefore, I can write this as a product of the expected values. And only because they are independent. And then individually, these are both zero, in fact. OK? And uh, so my final result for that is rho times t. Right? Expected value of w squared is t. OK, what about the expected value of xt squared, yt squared? Again, you can just go back into the basic definition in terms of the w's. So it's w squared, rho wt, 1 minus rho squared, square root, wt perp, all squared. And you have three terms now. So that's the expected value of, um, so if we square the first term there, the, the, the rho, we're looking at that thing. Let's uh, square it and, and at the same time multiply it by w squared. We'll get rho squared, expected value of w to the fourth, plus 2 rho 1 minus rho squared, expected value of w squared wt perp um, times wt. Okay? So, I'll simplify that, wt cubed. That's from the cross term, right? So we have twice rho w times squared 1 minus rho squared wt perp, and we're multiplying that whole thing by w squared. So we get w cubed wt perp. And then the last term there is expected value, or 1 minus rho squared, expected value w squared wt perp squared. Ah, okay. <laughs> so now what can we do? What's the first term? 3t squared, right? You can remember that fact or derive it. What's the middle term? It's zero because, again, w cube is independent of w perp. So that equals the product of the expectation of w cubed and w perp, and both of those happen to be zero. So, in fact, it's just zero, the middle term. And then the last term, I can use independence once again, because w squared is independent of w perp squared. So that's the expected value of w squared times the expected value of w perp squared and the expected value of w squared is t, the expected value of w perp squared is also t, so I get a factor of t squared. Okay. So I left out a few of the details now when I'm just saying them in words, but I think by now it's kind of becoming old. Okay, so you can add those together, and of course you get 1 plus 2 rho squared t squared. Okay. 
And then you go back here to the actual calculation. So the variance is that term minus that squared. So what's our answer? Final answer for the variance, it's 1 plus rho squared t squared. Right, there's the 2 rho squared t squared gets killed by, by this term. One of them gets killed by that term because our answer was rho times t. Okay, questions? No? Nope. All right, great. So now's the time for your quiz. You probably saw that coming, right? Great. Okay, so the last thing that I'd like to uh, cover today is this, um, this ITO integral that we talked about before. And before actually going through that detail, I'm going to suggest something that for you to work on. We talked about quadratic variation before. There's something called a covariation, and you can imagine what that is, right? It's basically, instead of taking the square of a process and summing up the increments of that process, sorry, instead of taking the sum of the squares of the increments, you take the increments of the two different processes and product them together. and sum them up over a partition and take the limiting case of the partition going to zero. So what do you expect this result to be? What's your guess? Zero. No? Well, you know, for Brownian motion, it's T. What? Rho times T, in fact, is what it turns out to be. So we like the absolute value? Nope, not the absolute value. So it's the covariation, because you want to know whether or not when one moves in one direction, the other moves in the same direction. Or if it moves in opposite direction, then that's why you don't put an absolute value there. So this is called the covariation of the process. And, oh, sorry, forgot this. <clears throat> so you can actually, you can demonstrate this result using more or less the same technique that we use to show that the quadratic variation is t almost surely. More or less the same technique. So try this out. It's a, a good exercise for you to do. Okay, so what I would like to, uh, what I wanted to cover in the last part, okay, sorry, there's a question. Yeah? Uh, yeah, that's more or less, so for quadratic variation, what we did is we said, let's look at the difference between what the answer is and, and what that sum is for a given partition, and then we show that that sum had a zero mean, sorry, the sum minus the, what we expect the answer to be had a zero mean, the error had zero mean, and the variance was bounded, and it goes to zero as the partition went to zero. So we'll the same method. Same method. Same method, except now these are correlated Brownian motions, right? The X and the Y process here. Okay, so I want to get back to a question that we kind of left hanging uh, last lecture. And that question was, we were looking at how do I compute, well, first of all, even how do we define a stochastic integral? The integral of X dx, or sorry, let me not put X here. Let's put W since we're talking about um, the standard Brownian motions, W dW. Right, we wanted to know how do we define this thing. And I gave you one, uh, one definition was we could take a partition of the time zero t, take that limit going down to zero, summing over all of those intervals, and evaluating the integrand, which in this case is W, at the left-hand point, multiplied by the increment of the Brownian motion over that interval. And it's very important that this, uh, that this evaluation of the integrand, which is corresponding to that term there, that this is the left-hand point or the left-hand side of the, of the interval. It's not the right-hand side. It's not the middle. 
It's not some other point in between. Those are valid definitions. I could put WTK plus, uh, sorry, I could put the average of TK and TK plus one there if I wanted to. I can actually do that. It gives me a different definition and it would have different properties. This has a very nice financial interpretation in the sense that when you take positions in assets, you hold them at one point in time over a short interval, at least, you know, a few seconds even, if it's that, um, at, at the, one of the highest scales, or there are even millisecond scales, but that's probably typically as high as you'll go. More usual would be daily, weekly. And you hold that position constant. So you would really have the left-hand side of the interval being showing up there. And the question that we, that we um, wanted to answer is, how do I um, compute this limit and what should the answer be? From standard calculus results, we guessed that the answer would have been one half W squared from standard calculus. But we did this nice little computer implementation and, oh dear. <laughs> I am not sure which file this is, so that's fine. We'll just do it ourselves again. Um, we did this little implementation which, which numerically demonstrated that the result should be not one-half W squared, but rather one-half W squared minus a half T. So I'm going to remind you of how that worked again because it's an important, it's an important one, it's one of the really key fundamental um, examples to work with. So we're going to generate some random numbers here which are going to give us our path. We'll do this for one year and the number of steps, let's take say a thousand. Okay, and so those are going to generate our underlying noise. Our Brownian motion is going to be equal to the sum of all of that noise. Um, summed up and we're going to be multiplying by the square root of dt so that we have this be normal zero square root dt. We're going to start at zero as well. Okay, so this should give us our path for the Brownian motion. Um, what do I want to call this? Uh, SDE w squared. Oops. Well, it doesn't matter. The title of the file is irrelevant. Uh, okay. Okay, so this is our sample path for the Brownian motion itself. And we'll like to investigate whether, uh, whether when we integrate, so when we compute this sum, whether that's going to approach a half W squared. So to compute that sum, WDW, which is what, uh, what we wanted to compute here, that's, this is our left-hand point, okay, so we go to the left-hand point, and we're going to be multiplying that by the increment of W, so this is W from okay, and that should be the integral of WDW looks a little cryptic, I know. That's just MATLAB code for you. And, oh, I need to, I need to sum the whole thing. Okay, good. There we go. So that's our path for WDW. That's for one, one outcome. Run it again. That's another outcome. Run it again. That's another outcome. Run it again. So this is clearly not a half of that thing squared. First of all, if you squared this, you'd always get something positive. And this clearly has a negative undertones in it. So what we could do, uh, I could plot side by side W, a half W squared, just for, again, purpose of comparison. So 
So the blue path will be the, the integral of w dw, the red is w, half w squared. Clearly a difference. And if we look at the difference between these two paths, so let's make another plot. Okay, this is our error between the two. This is the red path minus the blue path. And on a path by path basis, this is just one simple, simple one specific sample path, and we already see that it has a fairly clear trend. Right? It's trending downwards. Looks like it's going down with a slope of a half. And I just keep running a bunch of scenarios here so that you can see no matter which scenario I run, I get something that's almost a half. And if I increase the number of steps here, say 100,000 steps, that's my that's the difference. This is still a one-year time frame, so I'm just taking finer and finer meshes, right? So my partition is getting more and more exact. I'm finding a line that's more and more approximate in this. So we know what the answer should probably be, right? The correct answer for this result should probably be one um, a half w squared minus a half t. Right, that's what we would like to show. So that's our task for this last part of the lecture today. And this is going to be a lead-in for something called Ito's Lemma. Okay? So uh, how do we do this? How do we go about and show it? One obvious approach is take the difference between exactly like what we did for, for the, part for the uh, quadratic variation. Take the difference between what we have, the finite partition, and what we believe it to be, call that an error, and then show that that error actually um, has a zero mean, and in the limit in which pi, in norm of pi goes to zero, goes to zero. Right? That would, that's the goal. So it's exactly the same technique. So let's define R pi. This is our remainder for a particular partition. kind of reminiscent to what you do when, um, when you're in first year calculus and you're trying to show that the Riemann sum converges to a half W squared, right? It's kind of a similar thing. But here you have stochastic processes also thrown into the mix. So we're subtracting a half W squared minus T. Okay? So the idea here is to, to put that minus a half W squared minus t together into the sum itself. And since you have a fixed partition, what I can do is I can always write a half wt squared minus t as the sum over the increments of a half wt squared minus t. Right? If I think of this as just some, some new process x, what I will do is I'm going to replace it by the sum. Okay? Just the sum of its increments. Those are equal, right? Because this gives me the first point minus the last point. It's a collapsing sum. So that's exactly what I will do here. So now I'll put everything underneath the sum. Whoops, WTK squared minus TK, and I've run out of space. Okay. So, is everyone convinced that this last term that I've put under the sum is identical to that term? We're convinced of that? Right? It's this collapsing sum, right? I'm taking A1 minus A0 plus A2 minus A1 plus A3 minus A2, and all of these intermediate things will cancel. And I'll only be left with the last point minus the first point. And the last point is this term. The first point is zero. Okay, so once you've done that, actually 
that's almost the entire trick. There's almost nothing left to do. All it is is just some algebra on here. Okay, so let's collect a bunch of terms together and um, we'll keep the T by itself. So I'm going to write way over, maybe I'll write on a separate line here, minus TK minus TK minus 1. Okay. And what I want to convince you of, there's a, there's a factor of a half out front, I'm going to convince you that when you collect all of those terms, what you end up with is simply WTK squared. I want to convince you of that fact. Okay. Looks surprising, but it is true. So let's expand this, um, this, this, this term here. So that's WTK minus WTK minus 1, all squared, and that's WTK squared minus twice WTK, WTK minus 1, and plus WTK minus 1, all squared. Okay, so we simply have to identify those terms. We already know this here is, is, are those two terms, right? The T is fine. The only question is, do the W sum up in the appropriate way? Well, let's look at the W T squared term. W T squared, where does it show up? That's the only place. Agree? W T K squared. That's the only place, and whoops, and that's where it is there. It has a factor of, ah, sorry, it's minus a half. Um, I think I might have a sign error here. One quick, I think I need an overall minus sign. Okay, we'll double check it in a second. Yeah, we need an overall minus sign, that's correct. Okay, so that term identifies, right? We have minus a half WTK squared. Inside of that sum, we do have minus a half WTK squared. What about WTK minus one squared? So where does it show up? There's one term here, and that's negative WTK minus 1 squared. And over here, you get plus a half WTK minus 1 squared. So when you combine those two, you actually get 1 half minus 1 half WTK minus 1 squared. So they match up. So there's only one term remaining, and that is the cross term, this, together with that, and those two together are that term. And notice there's an overall minus a half out front, so when I multiply that by the two, I'll get plus one, which is exactly what I have there. Okay, sorry for all the scribbling around there, but it's just algebra, right? There's nothing, there's no mystery going on. Okay, so once you've done that, now most of your work, most of your, of the rest of the work is, whoops, is, is also done. I'll fill those in. Oh, good God. <laughs> I'm erasing everything as I go by. <laughs> there we go. Did I, I restored everything? I think so, yeah? It looks right, restored. Okay, good. All right, so this is our remainder term for any finite partition. And I think it should be clear that if I take the expectation of that remainder term at zero, right, I can interchange it with the sum. The expected value of the increment of W is the increment in time, which gives me zero. So the only thing that, I'm, that I really need to do is, the only hard work is computing this variance. And what's the variance? Well, the variance is one quarter. Each term in that sum is independent of every other term. So it's just one quarter times the variance of each term. The constant tk minus tk minus one is just a constant, so that doesn't compute, that doesn't contribute to the variance term. But this does. And we simply need to compute this variance. And I'm not sure if you remember, but the result would be three delta tk squared minus delta tk squared. Okay. 
So the three delta TK squared comes from the, from the expectation of the square of the increment, which is the expectation of the fourth moment. Maybe I'll, let me put in, let me put in another line here. Skipping too much, too many steps. And we've shown before that this is just 3 delta TK. And we've shown, and well, that's the Brownian motion. So we simply get delta TK for the expected value of the increment squared. And there's a square there, and we square it again. So we have 2 delta TK squared. Same argument as before now. So this is equal to 1 half sum over delta TK squared which we can bound, it's less than or equal to one-half the sum of delta TK times the, the norm of my partition. And that is a constant, so I can pull it out. And this is little t by definition. This is all finite, so this limit is going to go to zero as pi goes down to zero. And the conclusion is, we have a remainder which has a zero mean and its variance goes to zero. Therefore, R converges to zero almost surely. And like I mentioned before, someone was asking uh, me whether this is convergence in probability or is it, convergence, or is it just convergence in, um, uh, in distribution. Uh, sorry, convergence probability versus convergence almost surely. And there is a subtle difference, but you can prove that you can, in fact, find a subsequence in which you do get convergence almost surely. So uh, what we've done, then shown is, what we've then shown is, in fact, that this sum of W T K minus 1, I might as well just write it like this, the increment of W. <coughs> is equal to a half W squared minus T, almost surely, which is, and this is by definition, um, the left-hand side there is by definition the stochastic integral. of WS DWS. Okay. Questions? In terms of sort of Brownian, in terms of stochastic calculus, this is perhaps one of the most uh, fundamental results. Oh man, I don't know why it's doing that. Other than the quadratic variation, becoming T almost surely, this is the next fundamental result for Brownian motions. And it, in some way, it's connected to that, right? It's connected to the fact that the, brown, the square of the sum of the increments converges to T almost surely. In fact, this error, if you look at it, that error is, is almost the sum of the square of the It's almost exactly the quadratic variation, isn't it? So we get that nice result. Okay, uh, there's a couple of things you can, a couple of more things you can learn about this, uh, about stochastic calculus just by looking at this result. Suppose you took the D of both sides of this equation, whatever that means, right, in a, in a very hand-waving sense. If you took the differential of this, then whenever you take the D of an integral, you just remove the integral, right? That's all it does for you. So you would end up with W T DWT which we know doesn't actually mean anything because Brownian motions are not differentiable. So without the integral sign there, W dW doesn't make much sense, but it's a, a, a sort of a mnemonic tool. So according to this rule, this equals one half the D of W squared minus one half DT. Right, if you just sort of apply the D operator to, to everything there. And I'll put all of this in quotation marks. 
And if I just put the dW squared on one side of the equation and the rest of the thing is on the other side, you end up with 2 W dW plus dT. If you were doing standard calculus, that's where you would have stopped. Right? You would say that the differential of the square of something is just twice the something times the differential of the something. Right? You just get 2 W dW. This here is the Itto correction term. And this term only shows up because of the fact that the Brownian motion has infinite total variation and finite quadratic variation. It doesn't show up for any other kind of process, for any other, for any differentiable process, I should say. Even if there are jumps, you don't get that term. So it's only, it's really quite special to Brownian motion that you get that correction. So then, when you look at that, you might ask yourself, well, what is the more general rule then? This is fine for quadratic function. We worked it out. But what if you were to take a Brownian motion and you just, so you, you, take, some, you take a Brownian motion and then you map it through a function to get a new process, okay? G of that Brownian motion. So this is a specific example where g is the quadratic function. But in general, what's the answer? It turns out that you need g to be differentiable enough for there to exist an answer in the first place. So g must be twice differentiable. Okay, so this notation means twice twice differentiable. Okay, so it turns out that if g is twice differentiable, then this is the first version of Itto's lemma that I'm going to give you. And Itto's lemma says that if you take the d in this sort of strange, weak sense, the d of g of w is equal to what you'd get usually from standard calculus, so one derivative of g dw, Plus, plus an extra term, one half, two derivatives of g with respect, uh, two derivatives of g, d, t. Okay. So this is your standard calculus, and I'm going to put this in quotation marks still. This is your standard calculus result. And this is your Itto correction. It's not too difficult to actually prove, mm, to do, to do a, a reasonably, reasonably rigorous, but still some whole proof for, of that statement. And it would follow along the lines of what we've actually just done. So what you do is you say that well, what does this really mean? This really means if you take the, if you integrate the left-hand side, that's the same thing as g of wt minus g at w0 equals the integral from 0 to t g prime ws dws plus one-half the integral from 0 to t g double prime W S D S. That this is what that statement actually means. It actually means this. And in terms of the objects that are underlined here, we have to make a few definitions still. This one, what is that? That's this stochastic integral, right? That's the object that we haven't fully defined yet, but we can say we'll define it. This is a stochastic integral. And this here can actually just be interpreted as either Lebesgue or, or Riemann. It really depends on what the function is, but Riemann is enough for our purposes here. So let's call this term, um, 
well, I'll just write it out here. So this integral is by definition exactly as how we defined it for the quadratic, um, for the quadratic function. It's, you put a partition down, you take the limit in which the partition goes to zero, you evaluate this, in fact, I'm going to write it like this, h, for any function h, it doesn't have to be g prime itself, for any function h, you take the Brownian motion at the left hand point, you multiply by the increment of that Brownian motion and then you take the limiting case of the partition going down to zero. For the, for integrals with respect to the Lebesgue measure here, you can define it in the same way. There's actually nothing too complicated about it because here, uh, or I should say, in, in this case, we had to actually make some sense of what does integral of dw mean, right? because dw is not differentiable, so this notation is kind of, it's, it's already a little bit loose. And we've made that definition specifically by, we, we've defined what we mean by this entire stochastic integral in this way. And we've defined it in that way so that this thing converges in some sense. Okay, it converges in this, in this L2 sense. For this integral, we don't actually run into that problem at all you can show that this integral here, because of the fact that ds actually makes sense, it actually makes sense to look at the measure associated with some, some um, space, some, sorry, some time evolution, then we can simply, we don't have to worry about uh, details of how we define this. We can actually use any point in the interval, wtk star, and here we would have the, w, the delta tk. So, you know, for a Riemann integral, you don't have to use the left hand or the right hand or any of those points. You can use any one there that, that you like. Most typically, this is going to be tk minus 1, simply so that you can make easy comparisons between this sum for a finite partition and the other sum for a finite partition. Okay, so this is what we precisely mean by those, by those terms or almost precisely mean by those terms. Now, what I'd like to do is use this rule as opposed to try to prove any of these things. Um, if, you, if any of you are interested in, in, in seeing the proof of this statement, come to me, I'll show you. Next class, I'll give you a hand-waving proof, which uses, in a very bad way, Taylor's theorem, Taylor expansion, and it's completely wrong, but people do it anyway. Uh, so the rigorous proof requires a more delicate touch. But for the last 10 minutes today, I will uh, show you how you can use this result, okay? So let's take an example, uh, an example of, well, we already, we already have the example of W squared. So what about W cubed? Might as well ask that question. So suppose a question was asking you, you were being asked, what is the integral of w squared dw? You wanted to find out that integral. How would you do that? Well, your guess, of course, is it's a third w cube, and you know that's wrong because this is stochastic calculus and you don't get the usual things. So since that's your guess, your guess is it's a third w cubed, what you can do is say, Consider, consider a function um, g of x equals x cubed, okay? Because you think the answer is a third, x, a third w cubed. So the, the factor of a third is, not, is inconsequential. We can get that afterwards. So why not consider g equals this? Then Ito's lemma, then implies that the d of g of w equals, according to Itzel's lemma, let me, I'll write it down again, it's g prime of w dt plus one half g double prime of w 
DW. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I made the mistake. I put the DW and the DT in the wrong place. Okay. So that's just straightforward Ito's Lama. That's actually the statement of Ito's Lama. And this equals, so what's G prime? It's 3x squared, right? So we'll get 3 WT squared DW. What's um, G double prime? It's 3 times 2 times x, right? So that's a half 3 times 2 times W dt. So now I'm after, so we, we've, we've already made some progress. I want to compute this integral, and that's showing up there. So let's isolate that term. Let's put it, everything on the other, excuse me, put everything on the other side, and I'll have w squared dw equals um, one-third d of g of w minus, well, the factor of 3 and the factor of 2 get cancelled, so we simply get minus w dt. And now I integrate both sides of the equation from 0 to t, and I'll have integral from 0 to t, ws squared dws equals one-third integral from 0 to t of the d of g of w minus the integral from 0 to t of ws dws. Now, what is the integral of the d of anything? It's just the, the thing evaluated at the endpoints, right? If you imagine this in terms of the partition, you're just summing up the increments over the entire interval, so you get the first point, get the last point, you get the first point minus the last point, okay? Or sorry, last point minus the first point. I'm confusing myself. <laughs> So our answer, this is one-third G W, uh, that's W S there, sorry. G. Whenever you have to integrate, you can't use the integration variable and the endpoints is the same thing. Right? So I need a dummy variable here. Okay, and then you simply put, what is, w, what is g of w? Well, g is x cubed, so this is simply w cubed. w0 is 0, so that second term is 0, minus. And the third is in front of everything, isn't it? I made one small, oh no, the third's not in front of everything. Yeah, yeah, third is not in front of everything. Thank you. I thought I made a mistake. Okay. We end up with that. So that's our result. Integral from 0 to t, ws squared dws. <coughs> In some sense, this is an integration by parts formula, almost. In some sense, this is really an integration by parts formula. You're changing the d operator to make it be applied to the w cube. And then you have your correction term. You know, the integral of u, v, u dv is u, v minus the integral of v, du, this thing. That's really what that formula kind of tells you. And what's nice about this formula um, is that on the left-hand side, you have a stochastic integral. On the right-hand side, you do not have any stochastic integrals. You have stochastic processes, yes, but that integral WSDS is simply a Riemann integral, and the W cube is just the process at time t. So, in fact, you've actually performed the integral. You now know that that stochastic integral is this object. This object is not something that's deterministic in any way, but you have an explicit form for it. You will not always be as lucky to be able to completely solve the problem. But generically, if you want to compute stochastic integrals of that kind, um, an integration by parts formula will always follow by applying Ito's lemma to an appropriate function. And usually the appropriate function to use is whatever your guess is from standard calculus. Okay? So I guess we'll, it's 
five minutes, so I think I'll stop there. That's as much as I'd like to tell you today.